Hi, everyone. Welcome to our rounds for uh, May 19th, 2023. We have Marquise Morrissey. She's one of our physiotherapists who works in our rehab department. Um, she is also a PhD candidate at Western University. Her research evaluates physiotherapy and occupational therapy rehab for adults with persisting symptoms following a mild traumatic brain injury. She also works as a research coordinator at Parkwood Institute in the Research Practice Lab in London. She obtained her Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology in 2015 and her Master's in 2018 at Western. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to get this shared here. Okay, so I'm hoping, can everybody hear me? Kathy, can you just audibly say that you can hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, so I want to thank all of you for coming today. Um, and as Kathy stated, um, I'm here to talk to you about mild traumatic brain injuries. So specifically looking at diagnosis, treatment, and special considerations for um, our Northern Ontario populations here. Um, and so, yes, as Kathy said, I am a physiotherapist at West Prairie Sound Health Center. Um, I'm also a um, PhD candidate at Western University, and I'm a research coordinator at Parkwood Institute in London. And so both my research and um, my work as a research coordinator um, revolve around mild traumatic brain injuries and specifically looking at treating persisting symptoms. Um, that is my bread and butter. So I will try to not make this too physio um, focused. Um, so if you have any questions um, at the end of this presentation, uh, please feel free to, to um, yeah, raise your hand or we'll, we'll figure that out with Kathy. <laughs> um, so yeah, so as I said, affiliations, Western University and Parkwood Institute. I also have um, financial support from St. Joseph's Healthcare Foundation in London. And um, this is for a research project that I will discuss in a little bit. Um, and so that is not just for me specifically, that is for our research to practice team. So the objectives of this talk here, so we're going to look at reviewing the requirements for diagnosing a mild traumatic brain injury. We're going to re-examine how to successfully refer patients with acute or persisting symptoms following an MTBI, discussing treatment options for acute and persisting symptoms. So again, I won't get too physiocentric there. We'll look at kind of more so grand scheme things that we can offer um, in the acute phase or just um, easy implementation tactics. And then I also want to zero in a little bit on mental health and how it impacts MTBI and what we need to do um, to assist with that. So looking at MTBIs in general, so most, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with MTBIs and concussions. So they occur following excessive forces applied to the brain. Um, however, we know that these forces don't have to be applied specifically to the brain. So we can get these translational forces that are applied to other components of the body when they come up and um, kind of have that coup contra coup movement of the brain within the skull there. And so when we um, looking at concussions versus MTBIs and what's the difference, terms are often interchangeable. So technically a concussion is the lowest grade of a mild traumatic brain injury. Um, kind of the differentiation between the two is MTBIs. Um, usually there's some finding on a neuroimaging and there's a neurophysiologic effect afterwards. So what that means is all concussions are MTBIs, but not all MTBIs are concussions, if that makes sense there. Um, however, for the purposes of this presentation, I will be referring to MTBIs. So just know that that encompasses concussions as well. And when we look at kind of the stats around MTBIs and specifically within Ontario, they're, they're really hard to track down. As we all know, not everybody seeks um, help or um, yeah, healthcare when they have a concussion or if they think they have one. So the odds of us accurately knowing what the incidence rate is, is, is not great. Um, however, the, um, the most recent and um, all-inclusive stat that I can find is roughly 1.2% of Ontarians experience an MTBI annually. And we know that we have increased rates in rural settings. So certainly um, Perry Sound is considered a rural setting. Um, this um, reference here that I have, unfortunately, they did break down um, incidents according to LINS. However, they didn't show that data they <laughs> specifically for the LINS, which I found to be very frustrating because I wanted a Perry Sound stat. 
However, um, just know in general that we likely have more concussion incidents as opposed to some of the um, larger centers, you know, Hamilton, Toronto, London, that sort of thing. We also know that um, roughly 16% of individuals experience persisting symptoms three months following an MTBI. So again, the literature is a little skewed. Sometimes it's a little bit lower than um, closer to kind of 15%. Sometimes it's higher up to 20, 25%. However, so we know that 15 to 20% of individuals have these persisting symptoms. And again, there's some, um, there's different information as to what technically qualifies as persisting symptoms. Um, if we look at the Berlin sport consensus on concussions, that's 10 days post, um, whereas more of our general um, guidelines, um, which I'll get into a little bit more, they usually look at three months. So regardless, this is a decent amount of individuals with an MTBI. If we think 1.2% of Ontarians have an MTBI and 16% of those will have persisting symptoms, that is a fairly large um, number of individuals. So who can diagnose an MTBI? So within Ontario, it is really only physicians, NPs, and neuropsychologists that can actually diagnose an MTBI. So certainly someone, you know, in the more allied healthcare, um, physios like myself, OTs, we can certainly um, speculate, <laughs> um, but we can't officially diagnose. And so in order to diagnose an MTBI, and I'm sure as most of you know, there is no objective outcome to diagnose. So there are, there's lots of great work that's going on with um, biomarkers. However, none of those have actually been validated in clinical use. Um, so hopefully that's something that's coming down the pipe a little bit more, but right now it's only a subjective diagnosis. So when diagnosing, we're looking at the mechanism of injury. So certainly something that's going to cause that um, force applied to the brain. We're also looking at signs and symptoms. So there is kind of a laundry list. However, um, we look at, was there a loss of consciousness? Now this is not necessary to diagnose an MTBI, but this is something uh, that we're certainly considering. So headache, vision changes, hearing sensitivity, slowed thinking, confusion, um, all of these things we're going to consider when we're looking at whether or not somebody may have experienced one. And then we also wanna rule out confounding factors as well. So alcohol or substance consumption, acute physiological stress, severe um, musculoskeletal pain, um, pulmonary circulatory disruption, syncope or hypoglycemia. Ultimately, some other factor that may be going on that may alter their mental state. And so, okay, so we've had a patient that goes and sees, um, you know, whether uh, somebody who can diagnose an MTBI, and then we've decided that they have an MTBI, or even, you know, if it's somebody that cannot formally diagnose, so um, somebody who has seen somebody who speculates that they have an MTBI, we really want to focus on education early on. And so with that, we want to make sure that we know individuals um, or that individuals know that roughly 85% of adults recover without tertiary intervention. So really just settling those nerves to know that the odds of them fully recovering are quite good. Um, but with that, we want to make sure that they do everything that they can in the acute phase to promote full recovery. And one of the biggest things with that is resting for 24 to 48 hours. So again, old school mentality, go sit in a dark room for X amount of time until you feel totally fine and good to go. Um, that is out the window. And so we really just want to have that short acute phase rest. And again, with rest, usually, you know, we think when we have the flu, our rest includes watching TV, um, you know, listening to music, that sort of thing. We really want to focus on actual total and complete rest. So considering what their symptoms are, um, so if, you know, if they, if they're having vision issues, we really don't want to sit them in front of a screen for that amount of time. Um, it may be sunlight music may be beneficial, um, or, you know, maybe reading a book that they've seen or that they've read multiple times, but we really want to focus on what their symptoms are and do promote things that are restful that are the opposite. Um, other things that can be great include, um, like adult coloring books, um, that sort of thing. And so with that, we want to have that 24 to 48 hours and then gradually resume activities that aren't symptom provoking. So again, at this time, at that 24 to 48 hour mark, they may not be completely symptom free and that's okay. Um, we do wanna start to kind of get them back into activities slowly. And again, not symptom provoking. Now, this is a really um, difficult term for us as healthcare providers, I think to understand, let alone for the average individual who's suffering an MTBI. So what does this mean? So this is kind of my, my little plug for an app that I've helped create, um, which may be appropriate for some of your patients. Now, again, we don't 
promote this app without um, somebody seeking healthcare advice. This is just kind of a supplementary option to maybe help under people understand gradually resuming activities. So if, um, if any of you are familiar with kind of Weight Watchers and how that whole system used to work. So it was, you had so many points in a day that you could use and um, each, you know, each meal was worth a certain amount of points and that was kind of it. You could only use up those points in the day. So this is a similar concept, but for activities that they may be performing during the day. So as you can see here on the left, um, this is kind of what the calendar would look like. And so each day, each individual has a certain amount of um, points for their activities. And so as they add more activities, they, they accumulate points. Now, different activities are worth different points. And this has been the initial kind of point value um, was created by our healthcare team at Parkwood. Um, specifically, this app was really the brainchild of an occupational therapist there. Her name is Becky Moran. And so she's really kind of um, created this bank of activities to initially kind of help people and get them started. However, these activities can vary in terms of um, their point value. As you can imagine, some activities are easier for others. So as time progresses, they can kind of finesse those a little bit using our algorithm. So they add these activities to their calendar. And so they're able to objectively see, you know, what, what they can do and, and what may be too much. So not only is it helpful for the patient that we find, but it also helps other individuals. Um, we know that brain injuries are this, you know, the invisible injury. And so people may not, you know, friends, family may not understand when a patient says, Oh, I, I can't go, you know, to the, to the movies with you. However, they were able to do X, Y, or Z at home. And so this kind of gives them that out. It says, no, like I'm, I'm full. I've used all of my points for the day. And I, if I go over, I'm, I'm going to have worse symptoms. So this concept in general of pacing and planning is a great option to have. Um, this app is just a nice little objective aside that you could use to supplement. Um, but yeah, so that pacing and planning is kind of a tricky thing to understand, but it's something that we really want to own in on because we don't want these patients to not do anything as that isn't helpful, but we also don't want them to go back full blown because they're just going to overexert themselves, have all of these symptoms, and it's just going to be this cycle of where they yeah, have all these symptoms. So they rest and do absolutely nothing. They get back to baseline and then this keeps going. So this sort of concept helps people gradually resume these activities. We also have um, uh, protocols and infographics for different activities like returning to school and returning to work. So this one here I really like, it's from Parachute Canada. And so again, more so obviously pediatric based for returning to school, but gives specific outlines in terms of, you know, what activities they need to do before they kind of progress to the next stage. Um, what you may be seeing if they need to kind of spend more time at that current stage, that sort of thing. So these are really easy for not only us as healthcare providers to reference, but even to give um, our patients as well for them to have an understanding and to follow along. So outside of, you know, resuming their normal activities at, you know, at the pace that they're able to, we also want to really um, promote sub-symptom aerobic physical activity after 48 hours. Again, I'm a physio, it's my bias. However, all the literature shows that physical activity is huge with promoting um, MTBI rehab. So again, this is after 48 hours. And so in order to promote this, so A, certainly you can refer to a physiotherapist. Um, how, there's also things like the Buffalo Concussion Treadmill Test that can be performed to help identify kind of what heart rate we want these participants looking at that would be sub-symptom. Um, however, it's, um, it's something that can be implemented in such a short span early on. And so we're talking, you know, maybe five, 10 minutes um, and just low grade. So especially if you have somebody who was active before, they may feel slightly ridiculous, you know, going from say running multiple kilometers, multiple times a week, going just back to say a five minute walk. Um, however, this is huge and, and we need to find that, that area where they can and where they're not promoting their symptoms. Um, and so I also, so outside of walking, because there can be a lot of, um, symptom provoking factors to walking besides the walking itself. So especially if you're walking in a busy area, um, if you're walking, you know, in on say like the road trail where there's lots of routes and things that they need to consider. And so we're changing our, you know, our vision scan quite a bit, um, or even, you know, if they don't want to walk alone and they want to walk and talk to somebody that can all be symptom provoking. So I also like to recommend a stationary bicycle if they have access to that. Um, it can really kind of limit the additional factors that may 
flare up those symptoms and really just focus on that aerobic activity. So outside of general activity, we also um, want to look at returning to sport. And so if that is something that these patients are interested in, again, Parachute um, Canada has a great um, kind of breakdown of how to progress these activities. They also, it's great if you go on their website, um, they have lots of different return to sports strategies for specific sports. So I think there was probably 20 plus sports that were listed there. So if you really wanted to hone in on, you know, say return to ski, return to hockey, return to swimming, that sort of thing, they pretty much have one for just about every sport you can think of. But I do like this general um, return to sports strategy here. So again, something that's great for us as a healthcare provider and great to provide to the patient as well to help inform them. Outside of the um, physical activity, we also want to promote consuming omega-3 fatty acids and melatonin. So omega-3s, the, the, there was a recent systematic review that did show that they, um, that omega-3s help um, with uh, neurofilament development and essentially brain health um, and with um, rehab. So more in the acute phase. And they're also with melatonin as well to help promote sleep and to help promote neuroconnectivity, um, obviously in the, in the acute phase as well. And so both of these are, again, something easy that we can promote. So whether it's actually from a supplementation for, you know, melatonin or omega threes or within their diet as well, just simple things that we can do to just help promote that brain health. And then additionally, um, providing resources. So again, education, we want to make sure that they're up to date, but they're not just, you know, WebMDing what's going on and pulling from resources that may not be credible. And so the CDC has a heads up campaign, which is great. Um, the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation, um, which is now, um, if you Google it, it's a brain injury guidelines. Um, they have a really great all encompassing um, uh, guideline for, uh, there's one for clinicians. And there's one for patients as well. And so this is a really good one to reference either gen with general outline, but then getting into some of the more specific um, treatments for say headaches, vision deficits, that sort of thing. And then, as I said, as well, Parachute Canada, I find is really great um, for um, things that you may provide to the actual patient themselves. They're, they're easy to read. They're clear, that sort of thing. Now, if we get out of the acute phase of an MTBI and we're looking at more of our persisting symptoms. So again, that roughly 16% of individuals that are still experiencing symptoms at three months. And so we want to make sure that we're kind of flagging these individuals early on to make sure that we're, that we're following them appropriately. So if they do have these persisting symptoms, we can get them in with um, the healthcare providers that they need as soon as possible. And so our increased likelihood for these individuals are those with men pre-existing mental health conditions, um, those that identify as women, and um, those with less education. So again, just kind of in the back of your mind, if you're seeing these individuals with an acute brain injury, um, and they fit these criteria, making sure that we're thinking long term that we want to, you know, make sure that we're following them closely, and that they are that way we can refer them if need be. And again, these persisting symptoms can have, there can be a, there's a laundry list of things that we may see. So deficits with vision, with balance, um, with cognition, hearing, mood regulation, headaches, autonomic functioning. There are, again, there's a laundry list. Um, I personally like to use the River Mead post-concussive questionnaire when I'm evaluating um, persisting symptoms. I find it's, it's a good, um, it's quick, which is nice, um, but it's also fairly all encompassing. It kind of hits all of the options and there's, um, there's also the option for patients to add, I think two or three more, um, symptoms that if they weren't in the list as well. And so if we are seeing these individuals with persisting symptoms, so again, I'm not going to get too physio focused here. Just, these are some quick things that we can recommend, um, that can help. And so with vision, so binasal occlusion. So for those of you that don't know what that is, um, it's putting some opaque tape on your glasses at an angle um, that's more, that's kind of right more midline. Um, again, I can provide any um, images for that if anybody would like to see that. Um, but we do see just because oftentimes they're with vision and tracking um, that we're not that kind of area where the um, where your vision overlaps. This can create an issue because if things aren't all connected and working at the same time. So this tape helps the eyes work independently and <clears throat> helps reduce that you know that headache and that confusion. So binasal occlusion is a really quick and easy thing to do. Again, if somebody doesn't wear glasses, 
they can go to the dollar store, get like a non-prescription pair of glasses to use to just throw these on and just to try as well. Sometimes it can be very beneficial just to try in clinic and see if that helps. Um, cover colored overlays as well. Again, kind of the same theory behind tinted glasses. Um, so whether they're reading, looking at screens, whatever it is, certain colors seem to work best for other people. There's really no rhyme or reason from what I understand. Um, so certainly giving variations a try. Um, also a big one is night shift on screens. So if they're on their phone, on their computer, that sort of thing, um, switching the contrast. So that way it's more so that black screen with the white writing um, that seems to be processed better for these individuals and helps them not have a headache if they need to be on screens. And again, wearing sunglasses, wearing hats, especially indoors with the fluorescent lights can really help with that. So with hearing deficits or with hearing issues, um, looking at noise canceling headphones as well as um, having more so white noise. So again, that um, we wanna think of kind of that gradual resumption. And so especially um, in individuals with say tinnitus, um, it's that no noise whatsoever, which can really help bring that out. So sometimes having that white noise on can bring down that tinnitus and, and help reduce the other issues that they're having. Um, sleep is a big one as well. They often tend to either, you know, they're napping all day <coughs> or, you know, they're struggling to fall asleep at night. And so we want to really promote, you know, good sleep hygiene routines, um, proper nutrition, again, that exercise, which we know has multiple benefits, um, watching their nap schedule as well. If they're stating that they're really having trouble, trouble falling asleep at night, what does their daytime look like? Are they, you know, are they napping most of the day and also looking at their caffeine consumption as well and kind of when to limit that also memory and attention deficits, which can be very common. Um, so we want to encourage, you know, taking breaks. And so not kind of trying to hammer things out into the normal amount of time that they would take more time. Um, and when we say take breaks, oftentimes you want to switch tasks. So if they're working on something that's more of a cognitive task, um, what their break should be something that isn't cognitive as well. So they shouldn't be going from say reading something to watching TV. It should be okay. If, if I'm working on something for work and I'm writing something, my break should be maybe, um, maybe a light walk, maybe a little bit of yoga, or maybe it's something that's, um, more auditory as opposed to visual. So really switching those up. We also want to avoid multitasking, really just be able to focus on what you're doing and try not to get distracted by other things. And then also writing things down. That's huge, you know, sticky notes, wherever it may be, um, reminders in their phones as well. These are certainly things that during the acute phase, um, and even with the persisting symptoms as well as they're starting to work on tackling these, um, just having these reminders can really be beneficial so they don't miss things. And then also keeping routines. I mean, I, I also can attest to that when I'm in a routine in my life, I, I forget fewer things and I don't have an MTBI. So I'm um, making sure that we're promoting just kind of consistency in their life, especially if they're, you know, if they're off work, um, that in and of itself can kind of go into the mental health component as well. Um, if we don't have that routine, if we don't seem to have purpose in our days. So not only is it helping our memory and attention, but it, it can help things feel better and um, see how the days have more purpose if we have those routines. And so again, um, looking at the mental health component. So again, this is brief. Um, I am not a mental health care provider. Um, however, you know, meditation and mindfulness, and there's certainly, there's some apps that they can get. Um, the Calm app, which I believe is free, is a, a big hit, I find. Um, also adult coloring books, um, support groups, um, finding other individuals that are going through the same thing that you are, I find works very, very well um, and kind of helps them know that what they're going through is normal. And it's, it's, they're not crazy, especially considering, again, it's the invisible injury. Sometimes they, they kind of second guess themselves and why they're feeling the way they're feeling. So having those support groups can be huge. And there's lots online, especially Facebook groups, that sort of thing. Spending time outside, we know the benefits of nature just for general health. And then as well, I also like to add, you know, pet therapy, snuggle your pet. If they have, if they have a pet or if they have access to pets, you know, taking that time and just spending time with them can really help bring them down and feel better. Now, generally looking at these symptoms again, because they can have kind of a plethora of symptoms. And so it can kind of feel overwhelming in terms of what, what do we do? What do we tackle? So really think about treating the symptoms themselves. So treat what you see. And so if it is a vision deficit, then, you know, we want to, we want to tackle those vision deficits and um, try to take things one thing at a time. But with that, we also want to make sure that we're prioritizing. So really um, 
consider the individual, talk to them, what is the most troublesome symptom for them? Because we may think, oh, your headaches must be the worst, but it's actually their, you know, their vision deficits or their inability to return to exercise that is really bothering them. And that's the biggest, you know, hindrance to them right now. So discuss with them, tackle one thing at a time, because again, too, because they can have so many different symptoms on a spectrum, um, we can all of a sudden have them getting referred to all these different allied healthcare prov- or healthcare providers in general. And this is, can be too much and overloading. So if they, you know, if they have, um, they have appointments with their optometrist once a week, and then they also have OT twice a week, and then they have the homework associated with those and they're trying to get their exercise in, it can just be too much. So making sure that you're open with them and discussing what they have capacity for and what they're able to attend. Because again, if we overload them, even though it all is treatment, it's going to flare up their symptoms and it's just, it, it won't benefit them in the way that it should. And again, the biopsychosocial approach, consider the human, talk to the person. There is so much more to the brain injury than um, just what we see in terms of symptoms. It's, it can be really debilitating, especially you know, these individuals, they may be off work, they may not be able to attend their kids soccer games that they love to do, they're not able to, um, you know, take their dogs for walks that they used to, all of these factors can really impact them and their mental health. So making sure that we're really looking at them as a whole person. Um, And then also with, um, with the, with treating them, um, with their multiple symptoms and really trying to not overload them. We've looked at that at Parkwood. And so this is a paper that I was fortunate to be a part of. And so we did a combined physio and OT rehab program for individuals with persisting symptoms. And so these individuals were roughly two years post-injury. So they were very persisting symptoms. Um, And we did kind of a circuit training format. And so with that, they were able to, you know, they, one station that they were at for five minutes was cognitive tasks. And then the next station was balance. Um, And so they would rotate through these stations again, moderate, uh, modified by the physio, depending on what their needs were. Um, But there was also an OT. So they had time to spend one-on-one with the OT and discuss, um, you know, their ADLs and if there was any problems there. And that we found that actually that these individuals improved um, tremendously. So we used um, a a goal uh, like the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure. And so they rated their own personal goals, both on their satisfaction with their and their performance, so their actual ability to do it. And so we did see improvements in both categories overall with these individuals. So just to kind of promote thinking outside the box, brain injuries, we're still, we still know so little about them. And so again, you know, we know that this was kind of, we, we know that these individuals, they, they can't see all of these allied health or all of these healthcare providers um, as they would like to. So integrating and trying to work together. And, and I, prom- I highly recommend that with all of us um, healthcare providers, we, we work as a team, we discuss with each other with, about these, this patient's progress and what we can do and how we can complement treatment with one another, um, because that's that's what they need. They need the most bang for their buck. And so, if we have so here specifically, um, if we do have these individuals with persisting symptoms and we need to refer them out, where do we refer them? So I was really hoping to have this um, really great list that I could give everybody for you know Perry Sound specifically, because we do get into a lot of issues with traveling for treatment. Um, obviously driving long distances can be symptom provoking and especially if we're expecting them to drive and then also perform their treatment and then drive back, um, long distances, it, it can be too much. Or if we're trying to schedule in the middle of the day with somebody else's schedule, it just, it'd be nice to have things closer to home. So I did reach out, um, to our ABI navigator of the Northeast region, um, looking for a list. And this list was extremely short, um, which was super, Um, disheartening. However, I'm hoping to work to change that in the future. But we do have um, an outpatient brain injury rehab program at HSN. And so this includes um, MTBIs as well. And so they do need a referral and your referral isn't online, you have to call or email. So I have both of those listed there. Um, Again, this is government funded. So that is great. However, I'm not sure what the wait times are. Um, I know at Parkwood, our our wait times were, were 
quite substantial, especially through COVID, um, getting better as we're coming out of that precedent. So um, keeping that in mind. Also, um, physio. So we have there, um, she had listed neuro north and neuro physio, but again, both of those are in Sudbury. So um, depending on the patient, that may or may not be appropriate. Um, I have Westbury Sound Health listed um, as I would be happy to take um, brain injury patients. Um, I am unfortunately off on mat leave right now. So once I'm back, I will be happy to take them and work with them. Um, but we also, you know, we want to look at OT, at audiology, at optometry, at social work, um, all of these different facets that may help these individuals. And so although we may not have people that specialize in um, brain injury rehab within the area, certainly reaching out to these individuals um, and seeing if they would be able be willing to take on these patients um, would be beneficial because any of these can play a key factor. And so I also just kind of caveat, I list social work as um, mental health. However, we know that there are psychiatrists and psychologists as well. Um, however, I find social work, the wait lists tend to be um, the shortest. And so that's kind of why I bias towards social work. Um, however, it's any mental health care provider that would be um, able to work with these individuals. So again, getting into the mental health component of MTBIs. So this is something that is near and dear to my heart um, because I think we certainly, I know myself as physios, um, it can be difficult to, to feel confident working with these patients because it's not necessarily within our scope. However, again, if we're looking at the biopsychosocial approach, um, this is part of humans and we do see that um, there is an increased risk of persisting symptoms in individuals with pre-existing mental health conditions. And so um, up to 25% of individuals with an MTBI will develop a mental health disorder within six months of their injury. So that's pretty significant when we think about it. One in four, um, considering that 1.2% of the Ontario population is going to have an MTBI and 16% of those are having persisting symptoms. And 25% of just the 1.2% of Ontarians are going to have an MTBI or a mental health disorder. That is a lot. So we need to make sure that we are appropriately advocating and treating these patients. Um, and the other thing is that we want to make sure that we catch them early. So this earlier treatment is associated with lower treatment costs and improved ret return to work rates. And in order to help catch those, um, the literature shows and promotes screening within two weeks of their injury. So right when we're seeing them in the acute phase, we wanna make sure that we're screening for pre-existing and any current um, mental health um, disorders or, or uh, any mental health issues. So most of the guidelines recommend um, the GAD-7, so the um, for anxiety and the PHQ-9 for depression. Um, so there are different screeners for PTSD. Um, I personally recommend the PC-PTSD-5. Uh, again, it's, it's only five items, so it's quite short and easy to implement. Um, it's also been validated as well. And so with that kind of clinical aspect, we wanna make sure that we have things that are quick and easy to implement. Um, so that's why I personally like this one. And again, these are just subjective qu uh, questionnaires for patients to fill out. So like any other intake form, I highly, highly, highly recommend putting these on as well um, when they're doing their intake. So that way we can get a quick idea, um, but also having a conversation with these patients as well, because again, we really want to catch them early and make sure that we are getting them the appropriate treatment as needed. Um, because especially if we can catch them in the acute phase, then we can reduce the risk of them having persisting symptoms as well. And so again, just um, a, a brief overview, um, depression, anxiety, and PTSD. So these are the three most common mental health um, disorders following an MTBI. And when we're looking at individuals that may be suffering from depression, we want to think about um, fatigue, distractibility, anger, irritation, rumination. Um, when we look at anxiety, we have fearfulness, intense worry, generalized uneasiness, and social withdrawal. Um, Again, that social withdrawal can be um, obviously more so attributed to the MTBI. Um, so we want to dive into that one a little bit for sure. And then with PTSD, looking at things like nightmares and hyperarousal. And the big thing with PTSD is um, individuals can still experience it even if they had a loss of consciousness from their injury. So keeping that in mind that even if they have some of that um, post-injury amnesia, they can still have PTSD from the event. 
And with these individuals, um, if, you know, if we do find that somebody may have mental health needs and they need support, we want to look at referring them for sure. So again, social workers, psychologists, and psychiatrists. Um, we also can um, look at, so in order to find these mental health care providers, there are a few different resources. So Connects Ontario, as I'm sure most of you are aware, um, it's, it can help you locate a mental health care provider in all of Ontario. It's super easy to use. There's also the Ontario Brain Injury Association. And this one is great for just um, resources within all of Ontario for anything um, brain injury related. However, again, like I said, we're pretty, we're pretty limited up here, but that's not to say that, you know, somebody that in a different area that offers virtual care may not be appropriate. And then of course, CMHA as well. And in terms of actual supports and services that you can recommend kind of off the hop. Um, so Bounce Back, it's um, an online uh, um, option and it's free and it, it offers uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. And so this is great because CBT has um, proved to be very beneficial for individuals with an MTBI and mental health um, needs. And so this one, and again, these are just, um, they're standardized videos and kind of they work through um, these different, um, uh, different kind of uh, grades of um, activities and it's free. So this is great. Um, and there's also Big White Wall, which is um, online support groups. And so this Big White Wall was originated in, in the UK and is now over here as well. Um, now, again, both of those are online. So keeping in mind, you know, what is the individual's tolerance for screens um, for virtual activities? Um, however, there's certainly options for, you know, you don't have to do everything at once and you can pace. So that is a good option as well. And then again, like I had said, um, Connects Ontario and um, the o OBIA for, um, for online services as well and to help locate um, an appropriate provider. And that is all I have for today. I wanna to thank you all very much um, for attending and for listening. And um, if you have any questions or wanted to follow up on anything, um, I have my email listed there. I am currently off on maternity leave with little George featured on the left. Um, so it may take me a little bit to respond, um, but I am um, monitoring my email. So happy to chat if you would like. Does anyone have any questions for Marquise? Go ahead and unmute yourself if you do. Hi, Marquise. It's Becky. Um, Hi, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> um, I have a question about the um, the brain pacer. Are the points based on like the individual's signs and symptoms, or is it kind of a standardized set of points, regardless of how people are reacting to that particular activity? So we do have a standardized bank of points. However, they're all able to be modified. And so we have an algorithm for that that we've created as well. So within the app, um, they can go in and, and so say it's like grocery shopping or something like that. And if it's say worth five points, but that doesn't seem to be appropriate for them, whether it's, you know, it's flaring them up too much or they're finding it gets really easy. Um, they can go in and modify. So they, um, they rank a couple different things and then that um, outputs a new point value for them. Okay, that sounds good. And my other question is, in terms of the 24 to 48 hour period, most, I mean, if someone feels like they have a mild injury, often they're not seeking any healthcare in that time period. So I know, um, there are like coaches and teachers that they're often educated on, on, you know, what, what to do after somebody might have like a potential concussion, but what other education do you know of for people who are in that, you know, who might be with the patient in that first 24 to 48 hours before they maybe access healthcare? Um, so I, yeah, I think, um, the, the ON, like, so ONF's guidelines are really good for that, for even for the acute phase. Um, yeah, so parachute as well, I would say, like, that's kind of my favorite for, for patients to use specifically. Um, 
I think so the like Berlin sport consensus, if we're looking at sports specific, um, I think they've put out some infographics and stuff as well. Um, so that may be something that they can check out too. And I know for like Hockey Canada, I think all the parents have to do the Rowan's Law training so that often the parents will know, um, you know, how to recognize um, potential concussion and, and follow the guidelines. I think that the trickiest thing is just getting people to be aware that they may have a concussion before they actually, you know, in that first 24 to 48 hours when they're supposed to be just resting. For sure. There's also, um, so, uh, concussion legacy foundation, um, which is, so it was in the States and it, it kind of came out of Boston, um, with the whole CTE component. Um, so I, I think they still offer, um, education. So they, they certainly have like lots of like social media and they have a website with information as well. Um, so with that, with concussion legacy foundation, we used to go in and do presentations at like local schools and for sporting, like sport teams, whatever it may be. Um, we also did like scat five, um, initial assessments as well. I'm not sure if they're still doing those because um, there's different chapters. I think most of them are housed out of like the larger university. So um, CLF has one in, I know like Mac, U of T, Western. Um, I don't know if uh, like Laurentian or Nipissing has one as well, but I know they have lots of stuff online. Um, so that would be something that I would certainly recommend, especially for teachers and coaches and that sort of thing is to have a look on there and make sure that they're up to date with that. Any other questions? Just one uh, comment in the chat there. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Hearing no further questions, we'll wrap it up. Thank you very much for uh, presenting today, Marquise. That was very well done and uh, very informative. It, uh, um, uh, from a nursing background, I know very little about the physio. So thank you for sharing your knowledge and your expertise. And um, our next set of rounds will be June 2nd and it will be with Dr. Tony Jeromarecki. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me.